Welcome to episode 162 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this week's episode, I chat with Nick Holland about football, law, governance and blockbusters. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host that advanced metrics say his top of the key three pointer must be defended, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, my three point stroke at the top of the key is where it's at its best. I just ignore the big men and jack it up. My name is Sean Callanan, and you are listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. You might be doing so on the refresh front page of sportsgeekhq.com. Please go check it out. I removed the sliders, listen to what my SEO guy said, change things up a bit, told people what I do. Sometimes people get confused and go, Sean, you're a podcaster. And sometimes I have to say, no, I actually do work in between interviewing people and sending out podcasts. So hopefully I've made that a little bit clearer. Digital strategy and the digital advice that I give teams, sports geek campaigns as I announced on episode 161, and then learning. The podcast that's the uh, third part of the puzzle of the, all the things that I do from a week to week uh, really thrilled to be able to have a really super topical podcast and podcast guest after working with the EJ Witten Foundation in the past few months and they had their EJ Witten Legends game last Friday at Eddie Head Stadium so I'll let Nick Holland a former AFL footballer lawyer and now CEO of the foundation do the introduction Uh, about himself and his backstory in the podcast. So I hope you enjoy the chat as much as I did and as much as I have in working with the EJ Witten Foundation. So here's my chat with Nick Holland from the EJ Witten Foundation. Very happy to welcome a good friend. He's just come off a big event last week. And I thought I'd catch up and get a bit of a recap. Nick Holland, CEO of the EJ Witten Foundation, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sean. I've uh, been listening for a, a long time now, so it's good to be actually joining you in, oh, in, you're in opening, person. You're opening with the long time listener, first time guest. <laughs> I was about to say that long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for, yeah. So before we get into the EJ Witten uh, Foundation and the Legends game. Um, I just want to go back, and it's a little bit uh, similar to the conversation I had with Nigel Smart, former AFL footballer that moved into the world of of business. Do you want to give people a bit of background of your career, both as an athlete and where you played and stuff, and then the transition post footy? Yeah, it's. Uh, I was actually listening to the Nigel Smart interview, and that was that was very good. And it was uh, I played just you know at the same time as Nigel but started shortly after and finished shortly after and it was interesting because um, I was the first group to go through as a full-time professional yep. athlete and um, and that's why and we'll, we'll talk about this later but that's why transition has become so important because no longer as Nigel started he started and he was working part-time playing football part-time and and then sort of moved into those areas where he, he was working but um when I was playing AFL at Hawthorne um no it was all about um playing football and uh, not so much about sort of having a, a career after it so um uh yeah what was important to get that transition but we, we can we can chat about that later but uh, yeah I, I spent uh grew up in South Australia I was in the uh, draft where Nathan Buckley went as uh, number one draft pick, so I, I had a, a good draft. Um, Nathan Buckley um, was also involved in the moratorium because it was when the Crows came into the competition. So uh, South Australian players couldn't get taken um, out of South Australia for uh, a couple of years while the Crows grabbed all, all, all the players. Okay, yeah, when yeah. the Crows were setting up yeah. and things like that, yeah. yep. And, th- and then that lifted and I was the first draft that was uh, available to be to be picked up. So it was um, it was a, a good opportunity to come to a, to a good club and I, I spent 13 years at, at Hawthorne playing uh, various uh, positions, starting as a, a, a tall defender and ending up as a, a centre-half centre forward in, a, in an era where we probably had the, the greatest centre-half forward of all time, uh, Wayne Carey, yep. uh, who I, I sort of uh, – 
loved as a player. He came from the same club as me at, at North Adelaide and um, he was just a champion. I, I tried to emulate what he was doing and uh, probably did it at a, a smaller, much smaller scale at Hawthorne. Yeah, so the people who are listening who aren't, who don't follow AFL and internationally, you know, uh, Wayne Carey is known as one of the, you know, the greatest uh, AFL players of all time, and in, in in that position, and arguably some people argue he is the he is the best. So you've gone through that, uh, you know, a slightly different period than than Nigel. You weren't working. When do you, when uh, did you start thinking what's post footy? Yeah, I grew up in a family where um, education's been so important and so I was always uh, going to study and uh, probably knew that um, AFL football, you, you paid very well, but it's not enough like a English Premier League soccer player where you, you, you make enough to go out and not basically have to have to work yep. for the rest of your life. And, um, and, you know, from the age of 30, is it, there's a lot of life left. Oh, I, I, exactly. <laughs> um, and... Um, you know, you, you're like uh, when, when you think about a, an artist. Uh, you know, he dies with paint on his clothes, but the athlete's life is uh, is, is all over in in his youth. Um, yep. You know, thirty years, his or her youth, um, thirty years of age in AFL, and you're washed up. So, you have to have a plan afterwards. And um, the AFL Players Association knew that once it went to full time professional, that was a really important um, aspect of a of a footballer's life. We had. Issues with um, some of our, our greats, uh, Gary Ablett Senior. Obviously, the transition was very hard for him. And even uh, in in my area, you look at um, Ben Cousins, who's, who's found the transition very hard. And it is hard, but what does help is having something to to go to. So, I studied uh, law, a, a law science degree throughout my, my career, and um, the the method or the or the plan behind that was that I knew that eventually I want to be able to sort of run a, a sporting organisation. Yep. And, um, so so where, did that, yeah. where did that come from? Did that become from loving the environment of the, of the, of the footy club and, and sort of were you starting to interact more with the business operations team and sort of seeing what they were doing or was it, you know, just, and, or was it just a wanting to stay in sport? Yeah, it was sort of a, a, a genuine love of, of sport and uh, AFL football as well. And probably when you're a kid, all, all you think about is high performance. And so there's there's obviously two sides of sports. You're either in high performance or you're in the administration side of things. Um, gradually, when I was at Hawthorne, and obviously I, I had the high performance side as a as a player, um, but interacting with those on the business side, I I, I found it really interesting, uh, looking at what they were doing and um, all the different elements that they. Uh, had to had to focus on, and um, you know, part of their role is not only the the high performance of of their team, but uh, looking at sort of broadcasting, governance, uh, financials, everything like that. So it was a a great area, and I, I became really interested in that. And so I, I sort of had the plan. Okay, well, I'll, I'll study in these areas and try and get experience and skills in in all those areas, and that that included you know governance, yep. um, financial areas, uh, broadcast. Ticketing, all, all those. All so those you're, different areas so you make started up a studying law while you were playing. Yes, yes. I was, uh, I, was I was studying law from uh, 1999, um, and uh, had done uh, part of my science degree before before then as well. So, and so, how was that? How was that? You know, balance. So there was a really good article just in the recent week. So part of the AFL season is now is that uh, they're moving into finals and there's a lot of delistings and, and players moving on. That transition period is starting. There's a really good article by uh, the former Hawthorne and West Coast player, Xavier Ellis, yeah. just just this week, I think it was, in the Western Australian where he sort of said it comes really quick. Even though you know it's coming, it comes really quick. And he sort of said he was out and, yes, he'd had a good couple of years being paid well, but he hadn't quite finished his degree and a and a quite not quite finished degree at thirty may as well be a not you know not yeah. never done degree yeah um you know so you was there was there tough balances because he talked about uh, football pressures whether they be you know rehab or or doing things from a high performance point of view training that took away from what he was doing with his study how did you try to get that balance right yeah it, you you never actually are fully prepared for that uh, that transition from being a um, uh, AFL player where you're held up on a pedestal, um, you know, everyone's talking about you, you're getting the adulation of the, the crowd and then suddenly 
um, I went from being that AFL player to a, a first year lawyer and, um, you know, I was getting great income as an AFL player and uh, there, there's a rule that I think you spend three months on your um, fiancé's in, engagement ring Yep. and uh, uh, three three months' salary on your fiancé's engagement ring. That turned out to be my uh, whole salary for yep. the first year of uh, – well, and, and, and more for the first year of um, – Because it's effectively – my, my law, know, law degree. So. In, the, in the professional sense, it's like you're becoming a rookie again. It, it is, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so you go from uh, being at the, the top of the rung to, to suddenly being this uh, graduate lawyer and uh, getting all the tough jobs and um, – you know, photocopying and, and doing all the all the all the lackey work, uh, and it, it it is very very hard. But uh, I knew that I wanted to do those hard yards, and that was my sort of governance, gaining governance understanding, and the the policies and the procedures that uh, you have to write up as as lawyers for for organisations and getting to see sort of uh, businesses and and how they work. So it was very important in in my growth um, towards the ultimate goal. So so in so how long post you know, hanging up the boots, were you in lawyer land and, and you know, uh, you know, being in that space and building up skills and pretty much taking on every job and paying, you know, because you're in that paying your dues sort of space before you started looking again to get back into sport? Yeah, it was um, five years in, in private practice. I mean, I, I still use my legal skills now, um, you know, on a, on a daily basis uh, with, with, with what I do because it's a, it's a great background. But uh, it, was, it was five years, probably a bit longer than what I had have expected. I, I actually got excited by the law and also building up a case, going into the, the nerves that come about when you're trying to negotiate a settlement or negotiate a deal or even preparing for a, a court case. Um, appearing, I was a solicitor, but uh, occasionally you appear in a, a court case and that adrenaline rush actually excited me and sort of yep. kept, kept me in that industry. And then I, I made the progression out into what you'd probably call sports law, yep. and um, that was actually working on the Essendon case. Which, um, for, the, for the listeners that are international, we, we had a, a big um, supplements issue in in, in sport, uh, where a team was actually banned from, or well, players from the team were banned for the competition for a year because of uh, taking Ill- illegal uh, substances or prohibited substances. And yeah, so, I mean yeah. The, the people who have listened, you know, you can go back and listen to the uh, episode that I did with the guys at Essendon a year after they thought it was finished and then a year later their team was suspended. Yes, exactly. Like, like you yeah. can go to get a timeline of, you know, oh, we're back on track and then like that's how long that saga took. It, you know, it was like four years of that, that uh, I guess, that club's history that they, you know, don't want to look at but uh, it was a big legal case here in Australia. Yeah, and so, so that um, made me more and more excited about moving across to um, pure – um, sport and sports administration, and uh, from there I got an opportunity to go to the Australian Sports Commission, which is obviously the uh, national body for every sport, uh, from AFL down to to bocce. They're all uh, governed by the uh, Australian Sports Commission. The AIS, the High Performance Area, there is um, uh, falls under the Australian Sports Commission, and that gave me a really great opportunity to look at every sport. As I said, from you know our biggest sport AFL um, down to sort of working on judo to um, find their new CEO to actually help them transition from one CEO to the to the next and bring in a, a team with me and and work on their their governance, work on their their marketing, work on their their IT uh, with the team and, and sort of build them up and, and build a try and build a commercial product and one of so the that mu- I mean that must be good from a because the the AFL world is it is also a bit of a cocoon oh, like exactly. the the yeah. industry like it's a large industry but people can just move around in the AFL world and never see what the other how the other half lives and so whether it's these national governing bodies of big sports like you know cycling and swimming and basketball or the smaller ones whether they be you know judo or taekwondo or softball where it's you know 10 people or less running the whole sport across the whole nation, it must have given you a good cross-section of, well, this is where sport is. And it also shows how sport crazy Australia is that you've got all these federations pushing all of these different participation programs and and also national teams. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. So um, the the AFL 
is able to look after itself because it's a massive commercial enterprise. Whereas some of the the smaller sports, which are still Olympic sports, they're kitchen table operations. So how do you make sure that they're sustainable and they're able to um, uh, draw draw an income and actually then go off to the Olympics and be competitive against, um, well, say, for instance, judo is a good example. Not a big sport in Australia, but um, um, Vladimir Putin is a big judo uh, expert in in Russia and there's lots of money in judo in in Russia. So we had to sort of work out ways to create commercial uh, products and um, uh, to to make the sports sustainable. And that's how I got involved in athletics. I moved from uh, working with all sports to working with with one sport and um, building a, a blockbuster product, which was the Nitro Athletic Series, which involved Usain Bolt, um, fresh from the 2016 Olympics. He, he came across and um, and competed in Nitro, and it was one of the um, best events I've, I've been in, involved in, and it was built from, from nothing. It was built from the ground up, yeah, and yeah. like I was lucky enough you helped tee up the, uh, the interview with Johnny Stephenson, who helped bring out... Usain Bolt and again if you haven't listened to that episode go back to that episode but it effectively was to provide this compact built for TV easy to consume athletics meet as opposed to the longer form two or three days you can only sort of follow one thing and sort of de- develop that team element less uh, more so than the uh, than the individual element that track and field normally is so you were involved in that in sort of developing that because there's been this whole trend of how can we make this consumable game? We've seen Big Bash do it, Rugby Sevens, and that was uh, uh, Nitro was athletics version. Yeah, exactly. And, and going back to my time at Australian Sports Commission, I did a lot of study and research into into what product sells and, and what's what's best for the for the fan. It's got to be all, all about the fan. It's got to be all about the TV. And basically, it said um, you've got to spend money. You've got to build a, a blockbuster product because. People don't want to go see a, a second tier competition. Uh, that they want to go and see the the, the blockbuster. And um, so, we initially planned to have Nitro just amongst the uh, a, a domestic competition amongst the, the various different states in in Australia. And then, uh, thankfully, the, the president Mark Arbib sort of said, "No, we've got to get this marquee athlete. We've got to get uh, Usain Bolt." And uh, Johnny Stephenson was actually able to deliver Bolt and that, that, that made it because then we were the blockbuster. We got uh, broadcasting rights, uh, ticket sales were good, sponsorship came on, all from the signing of Bolt. It was a domino effect. Yep. Si- sign Bolt and then ticketing, sponsors, broadcast all came, all came on board. Because but we- it, it, it's really important to have that, you know, that blockbuster element because you know, when Big Bash came on the scene – it, there was a lot of sports, and I spoke to a bunch of them that said, "Oh, so all we've got to do is cut down our sport and make it easily consumed in two hours, and we've got a winner." Like I do remember talking to the guys at at uh, World Harness Racing who were thinking about doing one lap harness races, and in in the end, common sense prevailed because the trainers said. Oh guys, we've trained our horses to run two laps. Yeah. We can't just tell a horse yeah. to run one lap. Yeah. But it was like, you know, you can't just let the marketers go. Oh, cool. We're just going to take that out and that out. Make the goals bigger and the ball smaller and all of those. Oh, and it'll make it a big success. There's a bit more, bit more of a recipe to it, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, a sh- shorter version does uh, help, but it's got to have some element that excites, uh, draws the crowd there. It's got to be about the fans. What, what do the fans want? You've got to go out there and say, okay, um, what do you, do you want to see? And, um, if that's shorter, uh, then then that's the thing. But, um, you know, if you're going to go shorter, faster, higher, stronger, um, whatever you can do, um, to, to draw fans in, because once you've got, uh, fans watching it, then you'll have sponsors wanting to get on board. Then you want broadcasters to get on board. Um, and, you know, that's where the, the, the money comes from is, is largely from the broadcasters. So going from Athletics Australia and being part of, you know, building that product, building that block, 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 no, blockbuster, um, take us through your journey from there to being CEO of the EJ Witten Foundation and tell us a little bit more about the EJ Witten Foundation. Yeah, so the um, opportunity came up um, to – Move across to run an organisation, which which is a, a charitable organisation, 
but it does various different sporting events um, as a platform to, to build awareness about men's health and prostate cancer research and treatment. And uh, I thought, well, this is great. We're doing – I've got an opportunity to lead an organisation but do something uh, good while still sort of working on building sporting events and, and building marquee uh, events and uh, raising money that ultimately helps uh, – hopefully save men's life and, and, and builds awareness about that. So, uh, And just for probably those listeners in the, in the northern states and international uh, states, EJ Witten was the first uh, legend Hall of Famer to go into the, the AFL, AFL Hall, Hall of Fame. Uh, he's, he's called Mr Football because he's um, so universally loved and um, you know was, was so great at uh, AFL, AFL football and he died prematurely because um, of, of prostate cancer and back in those days you know uh, men didn't talk about it and they were yep. tough if they were, they were sick they wouldn't go and see a doctor and if he had have just gone in earlier seen the doctor and got a simple test uh, he'd still be here today so his son Ted Whitten Jr actually started up the foundation has been running it for 22 years and uh, as we got uh, you involved and you were, you were great in helping us out um, in... And that's, I mean, in, to give people, you know, background and, and context, yeah, uh, you know, Ted Witten, uh, I remember there's a, you know, famous uh, uh, lap of the MCG with, with Ted Jr. holding his dad uh, and he's waving to the crowd at a, at a state game, at a state of origin game. Um, there would have been 90,000 people there. Um, and it was in, you know, it was all in the papers uh, the next day. And I remember because my daughter was born that same day. Wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it was like, you know, and that was Ted's message stick it up, um, yeah. you know, go the VIX and, you know, supporting football. And he was Mr. Football. And so, you know, the foundation, uh, you know, was born out of, you know, his passing. And, you know, so that, so coming onto that role allows you to move you know, again, move up to move into that CEO's role to, to oversee everything. But one of the key, I guess, events, and this is what we're talking about from last week, is the EJ Witten Legends game where uh, effectively you revive State of Origin and, and uh, some of the legends of the game come out and play. So, you know, so take us through, because you only started in the role when a couple, four or five, four, four or five months ago, um, Give just you know, give people a bit of a lay of the land of when you've come in, and you know what's the lay of the land, what's the history, um, and what you're trying to build with uh, the EJ Witten Foundation, and, and also the Legends Games specifically. Yeah, the the, the Legends Games our um, marquee event, and as you said, it takes uh, Ted Ted Whitten was State of Origin football, and um, so it takes that, and it uh, has a, a Victorian versus All Stars for. for um, past players, former players of, of the game, um, and so you—I mean, you played in the game last I, year. I, I played in the game, yeah, as, <laughs> as, a, as a player. So uh, this year we were we were running the game, and um, the background—it's been going for for twenty two years, and now with with sport, um, you've got to make sure that everything is in place, is governed well, and everything's taken care of. And so my um, directive when I came on to the foundation was to, to make sure, okay, we've got um, our governance in place and we, we want you to take it to the, to the next level. So um, from my perspective, that's about, okay, making sure you've got the right people, the right policies and the right procedures in, in place. Yep. Um, the former... Event managers of it did a did it did a good job, but there probably wasn't enough um, policies. Money, yeah, policies and procedures in in place, and the and the money wasn't sort of getting through to the to the foundation. So, um, subsequent to that, we're only a, a, a small organisation, and because we're trying to make it this blockbuster event, uh, you you can't do that with the the small team that I've got. So I had to sort of identify, okay, where can where can we where can we grow? And um, I had to get the right, right people involved. And so that was one of my, my first calls was saying, okay, well, we need to promote this and get it out there, but we haven't got a 
five hundred thousand dollar marketing budget. Yep. Um, so the the way the game works now, from a partner's point of view, because again, you've got a small organisation, you don't you're not running stadiums and all of those kind of things. So the way that it's the EJ Witten game is now and has the last two years. If I'm, I'm right in yeah, saying, yeah, that's right. Yep. So it's now the partners are effectively the AFL and Channel Seven, or like how does how does it all work now? Yeah, so, so for, from an administrative side of things, you, you look at um, what, what you need from a game. You need broadcast, you need sponsorship. This is how you, how you make your, your money. Merchandise and ticketing, obviously the fans. So broadcast, uh, we signed a deal with Channel 7, Foxtel and Telstra, uh, the various different platforms, free-to-air, um, subscription TV and uh, on, on, online sort of watching the game. So that was – that was covered off, so we, we had that in place. So that was the the first and thing, ca- that and needed. that's a key plank because if you don't have the coverage, if it's not yeah. on Friday night football, then yeah. the sponsors it's a completely different uh, it's a completely different sponsorship proposition yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah e- e- exactly. And then sponsorship. So uh, there there wasn't great traction from uh, former years or great uh, documentation from former years. So we had to really go out and, and rewrite the, the sponsorship uh, book and uh, rewrite our, our proposals. And this year we, we sort of uh, turned that around. We got the, the greatest or well, the best sponsorship numbers we've got and it was uh, – well and truly over 25% growth on, on last year, which was, is, is fantastic. Um, merchandise, uh, we uh, are a one-off game, uh, so we, we put that together and the initial numbers from uh, 2017 on 2016 are showing positive signs of that, that increasing. But the big area that I, I, I saw, um, uh, saw there was opportunity was in promoting the awareness uh, of our cause through through the game and and, and through media, and um, that was also about getting people to watch the game and getting people to a- attend the game. So you can't come along and, and and buy their tickets. And and then the other part is also the message of the foundation. You know, the it's time to test yeah, messaging exactly. and that kind of thing because yeah. it's some people will look at. You know, a lot. You know, with charities and foundations, it's like oh, it's where it's a donation rally, and we need the cash and. Yes, that's great, and it helps fund your men's health programs. But your, you know, the foundation's goal. If you've got a fifty-five-year-old guy sitting there watching the game on the TV, and his teenage son or something says, "Go get tested," like that's just as important from a messaging point of view as well, isn't it? Yeah, and and we um, we we held the game on Friday, and it's uh, Wednesday today, and we've just got floods of emails saying, you know. Thanks very much. Got the message out, out of your game. I've I've gone and seen the the, the doctor, and um, and that's what it's all about. So the charity is about yes, raising funds for men's health uh, programs and prostate cancer research and treatment. But we've got to get that. Secondly, we've got to, or, or probably equally as important, we've got to get that awareness out there so people know. Okay, prostate cancer uh, kills three thousand three hundred Australian men a year. So it's the outside of skin cancer. It's the the biggest killer of men in Australia. So we've got to get the message out that just by having, if you can go and have a, a test, uh, then that reduces your chance of, you know, uh, well, there, there are cures and and you can sort of live along and prosperous and ha- happy life and, and see your grandkids. So that message was was something that I really wanted to to increase. Now. As, as I said, we can't do that ourselves. Yep. Our social media was non-existent yep. uh, when, when I got there. Um, we don't have the resources to spend, as I said, 500000 on a on a marketing campaign. Uh, so I, I brought uh, Sports Geek in to, yep. uh, to develop a, a program around our blockbuster event and the reach that we've had um, in – Media and social media has just been enormous in, in getting that message out. So not only yeah. do we have 675,000 people watching just on free-to-air, um, but there's there's been a, a 67% increase in um, media hits and um, social media hits from last year and then again through our own media platforms you know we, we've been doing things that have and, reached twenty thousand people at a time yeah and and that was the thing that like when i think was it maybe six weeks or like again it would ideally it would have been earlier yeah but like yeah. it was sort of six weeks hey what can we do and 
And it was a little bit of what assets have we got? And we had, you know, we had the Legends game as a Facebook page. It was a good asset. We had the foundation as its own thing. And it was the build awareness. Um, how do we get people to come to the game from a GA point of view? How do we sell out the corporate event yes. point, point of view, which, you know, is potentially a higher revenue ticket earner? Um, and then how do we leverage all the players that are going to be involved? Um, and so we we're able to, with, you know, limited budget, stretch it as much as we could um, just to build awareness because there was a, you know, again, we're build, doing it in the sporting calendar that the end of the AFL season's, you know, at its at its peak and people are, you know, it's getting into finals time and, you know, to get, to cut through the media uh, cycle to say, hey, this game is on when we know it's a three or four day window when they'll realise it's on, but we wanted yeah. to sort of elongate it a little bit. I think we had success in that and I think now the, the opportunity is to, you know, use that for both your, you know, your events that you're, you know, the, the blockbuster event of the EJ game, but then for your other events and sort of move it, move it forward. So I think there's, yeah, I think there's opportunities, uh, definitely opportunities there. And I think some of the, I guess, lessons that I sort of got it, got out of it were getting more access, you know, one of the first things we do is what's all the, you know, what are all the assets that you've got and what can we use and promote? And it was a little bit of a case of, oh, we don't have a lot, but I think what you do have now through both the content that was produced on the night and in the lead up to it, you've got a lot of content now that you can push out your message pretty effectively from a cost point of view to to your audiences. Yeah, and and some of the key things that that came out and the successes that we, we had, and, and I'll just mention two examples, but... Um, I was losing sleep over our corporate event because uh, a week out, um, it looked like we were going to have to basically can it because we yep. weren't selling enough uh, tickets to it. And uh, then a couple of days before the game, oh, sorry, as a result of just hitting it hard, putting content on it, uh, getting it uh, out there, promoting it through our social media platforms, um, using the players to promote it as well, we, we basically had to turn people away in the end. So that was fantastic. The other I area, do remember that. You're like, I haven't yeah. sold them. I'm like, we haven't marketed it yet. Yeah. Let me let me <laughs> let me turn on the ads. And uh, and so I think that was just again the compressed top, like when you're running an event, the compressed time, like it goes so quickly. Yeah, it does. And you want to say, oh, you know, we want this type of event doing. So it, again, you know, coming at it even yourself with a short run up to go, okay, these are the things we need to put in place to be able to run that, then there's less angst for, oh, we're not going to sell it out because every every event's that way. Every, you always lose seat when you're running an event. And the, the, the other area that we uh, had some – we kicked some goals and had great success was – uh, last year, donations um, weren't very effective and we really promoted that um, both in the lead up and then on the night and uh, uh, we tripled the donations from well, 2016. Yeah, well, that, that was just a bit of, you know, UX testing and seeing what was happening and, you know, thanks to Nick Walker and the guys at Walker Digital that put in all the changes but we're like, you know, and, you know, I've used the phrase steal with pride before. Like we just went... What page, what pages are working and what what worked well? Let's make sure we've got all those same options. So, you know, I do I, I did share with Ted on the night. I said I, one of the key things was we allowed credit card because it was only PayPal. Yeah, that's right. And we right. wanted to make sure it was easier for people to less clicks. That's always if you can remove clicks. And then literally it was I think it was Thursday when we were reviewing everything. We said, well, the default donation's five dollars. Let's change it to twenty dollars. And we're looking through, like, there's no five dollar donations, and it's like sometimes it's the simplest changes, oh, um, but exactly. also the important thing was the testing. Like, you know, we were talking to Nick Walker, and like, we don't want it to crash. The last thing we wanted to do is crash, you know. And I was checking my phone, and the donations were coming in, so the the website stayed up. Like, I think if you're going to have, you know, when you you don't really realize the power of free to air TV when they say go to this website, exactly. yeah. It does drive traffic, and then the good thing is now that we've we've captured those people from a from a donation point. We've captured them in Facebook pixels. We've catch like there's all these capture pieces that now you've got that you didn't have, you know, eight to twelve weeks ago. That now you can start leveraging, you know, whether it be follow up events or sending out the message or priming it for you know ne- next year and those kind of things. Yeah, exactly. And it was exciting on the night because uh, I had my phone sort of buzzing whenever a, a donation came through and you'd uh, get basically well, 
genuinely 100, 100 buzzes over a space of a couple of minutes and you look up on the TV screen and, yeah, there it was, uh, the you know, how to, how to donate. So it, it really does, does work. And, um, you know, when, when we were talking about um, resources, uh, you mentioned that, you know, I'm a small organisation, but we had to think of uh, innovative ways to get our message out there and, and to pr- promote the game. And so, yes, we didn't have a asset as a, and a big platform, you know, we didn't have a, a big budget, but, okay, we've got 60 X AFL players that ha- have all these followers on social media. So instead of us sending a tweet or a Facebook post or an Instagram post out to our limited followers, we went to Jimmy Bartels, who's got 100,000 plus followers. We even went to um, the WAGs, wives and, wives and Girlfriends of Players. So David Roden, uh, a former AFL player and now a, a goal umpire, his uh, wife did an Instagram post to her 50,000 followers. So we really use that uh, well and it um, it works in, in spades because people – Get a, become aware of the message, and uh, and it sort of helped us obviously raise funds and yeah, get the and, message out. And there. now it, I think now you've done, been able to do that with a, you know a few. It's like well, okay, with time in place, you have all of those you know promo packs, if you will, for every player. Yeah, like yeah, as exactly. you sign them up, you go, cool. Here you go. Here's your here's your tile to share on Instagram, and here's what you can post. And hopefully, you don't get the you know copy and paste this here and it gets posted in, which we've seen a few athletes do over time. But like the more of those you can give them, it just makes it easier because most athletes when they're, you know, they're told to do a whole bunch of stuff. It's like if you make that easy to go, oh, here's your post to, to announce. Um, and then I think the other outreach piece that worked well that I think you can tap into next year is also tapping into all the clubs and wording them up on, hey, guys, these are all your players here's a content article or here's an opportunity for you to do some content and it works well when, you know, the team is out of the finals and they've, they want to do something, that it becomes, again, a really good digital PR sort of exercise. Yeah, and, that, and that's where um, you, you came in with the, the idea, not only to the, the clubs but to the AFL and I was glad with your connection of Collingwood because just for the listeners, an, an example was we did uh, posts uh, saying about what players are in and uh, a bit of video on on, on the players. Um, the second highest player was um, uh, probably the Dustin Fletcher, who's who's a premiership player, and he's played third or fourth most amount of games of uh, AFL, and he got a reach of about eleven thousand one hundred people. Then we did one of uh, uh, Alan Didak, a Collingwood player, and uh, a video of his tricks. And he, he's he's actually known for being an exciting player, but he had twenty one thousand hits, so he was over and above. And it just shows the the. The, the power of Collingwood and yeah. the, the power of, uh, um, you know, that uh, magpie magpie jumper. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess that's the that's the piece where I think there is – there's a lot – like I think we had some really good results in from a digital point of view and there's a lot of assets now that you can play with. But I also think there's a lot of really good case studies that you can both go back to partners like the AFL and say, well, this is how we want – this is how we'd like to do it going forward because this worked really well. Um, this is how you want to better – in include the clubs um, and then I think that also starts a conversation of well how can we engage the clubs to get you know get more of their members to the game and th- those kind of things which again with the compacted time frame they were, they, we didn't really have the opportunity to, to do those sort of relationships but that's what you get to do over the next 11 months. Yeah, and that, that's important to, to learn from them because the event was a, a, a great success but there's always improvements that you can made and, and make and, and that's uh, what, what we've got to do. So uh, we'll be having our in retrospect meeting and um, flagging all these things because if you, if you don't learn from something, then it's an opportunity missed. So it's a, bit, it's a bit like, and I talk to like the people at Tennis Australia when they do the Aussie Open, when you have blockbusters, people think, Oh well, Mick, you've done the Le- EJ Legends game. What what do you do for the other eleven months? Hmm. Yeah. So what do you do? Like you know, because it has consumed a lot of your work life up until now. What do you? What's the role of you as CEO of EJ Witten Foundation? You know, for the other eleven months, what what are the things you're focused on? Yeah, so obviously that that is our our big event and most uh, well known event. Um, but September is the uh, men's health and actually prostate cancer month. So we've uh, deliberately uh, have our, our marquee event 
and our, our second biggest fundraiser is the grand final lunch. So that's uh, that's coming up at the moment. If uh, listeners are wanting to get a table, uh, ejwittenfoundation.com.au, they can uh, get their tickets uh, from there. Um, and so that's our, our second biggest fundraiser. But as I said, we use sport as a as a platform for that awareness. So we have uh, a, a race night at uh, Mooney Valley. We have a, a couple of golf days. And then we have a, a community program where we sort of go out and uh, spread that uh, awareness message. And we, we did uh, over the quieter or the, uh, the, the winter months, uh, we did uh, 20 talks uh, with Sons of the West, which is the Western Bulldogs sort of campaign, yep. to um, men that are, are going through an eight-week program um, to, to help them out with either health issues or um, issues that they've, they've sort of found um, uh, to just to, to bring them back on the right track. And, th- and that's been really a effective uh, community program. And um, the actual Victorian government's been really impressed with what we've been doing there. And we were voted the, the best provider um, in the Sons of the West program uh, in 2016. So hopefully we can replicate that for 2017. So it is very much uh, the the community programs and the and st- always building the awareness, but then interspersed with these events that are part of building the awareness piece, but also are fundraising events. Yeah, I- exactly. And then and then the other other sector that we can expand into is is just to um, go and work with with corporates and uh, and build awareness through those corporates but also have corporates aligned to this um this good cause and uh, that that can sort of help with uh, their um communal uh, or, or corporate social responsibility and, and also help them with their workforce and their professional development because it's another skill that some of their workers can can add to their repertoire by, yep. by being involved with this charity yeah and so yeah so it becomes less which is pretty much the last couple of months of Hey, I'm selling a, a, a blockbuster football game. To oh, if you're a sponsor and coming on board, and it's a year long thing, then these are the things we're pushing out into the into the market, and you'll you'll be a part of. And when the game comes up next year, you'll be part of it. So it becomes a a more complex and a bit more of a fuller sponsorship pitch than what you've been pitching in the last couple of months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, as as we discussed, it's important that. Uh, you're um, going to your, your fans and sort of saying uh, thanks very much for for your involvement. This is this is what we did, and it's not always asking for this, this, and this. But you're also saying thank you, and um, through your assistance, this is this is what we've been able to achieve. So that's that's the next thing that we, we have to do. With so, our- if there's any advice that uh, you could give Nick as he starts a DJ, like the, what you've learnt over the last you know, a couple of months and you've, you've got a Legends game under your, under your belt, um, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, it, it, I, I knew that th- this would be the case, but it's just about um, planning and going earlier. Uh, I'm sorry, understanding your research, resources and going out earlier to um, the, the bigger platforms that are uh, available and sort of, uh, yeah, getting them involved and, and helping you out because as a small charitable organization you can't you can't do it all yourself yeah and i think that's i mean i think that piece because there is that tendency in a smaller business that ceo means chief everything officer it does yeah right yeah. and it is you've got to do a bit of everything but there's also if you try to do everything it's not going to get done like so you know being that small you're sort of forced to go well those people are going to run this part and those people are going to run this part and you have to be able to, you know, let that go and have good people in place. Yeah, exactly. And, and we, we were sort of very fortunate that the AFL was in place and we had uh, TLA sort of helping with the uh, event management side of things, So, who, who both did a fantastic job and, and, you know, without them we wouldn't have had a successful product. So uh, you said uh, Wednesday, September 27, you've got your grand final lunch to get that uh, – that's coming up and that's – you know, again, looming, and you're in. You're back in ticket sales, table sales mode for that. Uh, that's your main focus. Anything else for the uh, for the rest of the year? Uh, so then we we have a little bit of a, a quiet period, but we'll have a, a few sort of corporate uh, Christmas functions where 
we'll we'll thank our our partners. Um, not so much fundraisers, but just uh, thanking our partners, thanking people for for being involved. And then it starts up again uh, with a uh, race night early in the in the new year, a few golf days, and then we we actually do some regional community uh, visits. We we go to uh, Central Australia for for one event, and we um, also sort of go out to regional Victoria, meeting with with people who wouldn't otherwise have access to um, the, the, the the knowledge and uh, access to it, sort of be able to see some of our a- ambassadors. Um, but definitely there's there's plans for another Blockbuster event somewhere in between that and that's sort of part of my role for, for next year. So I didn't want to finish without asking that because you've used the word Blockbusters a lot. Uh, you've got a book here that fascinates me it's, uh, that's got the title Blockbusters – Tell us a little bit more about that and uh, why why it's in your carry on right now. Yeah, so I was when I was at the Australian Sports Commission. Um, what part of my job was to to go to the the sports and say, okay, let's work out a, a commercial product. And so I did a lot of uh, research and and actually did some some study uh, in this in this area. And the um, uh, Harvard uh, professor Anita uh, El- Elberes did a uh, book all about blockbusters, and it talks about sports uh, and entertainment, uh, the, the, the media industry, and um, it uh, talks about Alan Horn, who was uh, head of a big mu- movie studio. Okay, and um, instead of going to little independent creative projects uh, that you don't spend much money on, um, he said, "No, we're going for." Blockbuster events, and uh, you know that's the the Marvel comic events, uh, the Batman's th- things like that that you could really sell. And they found that that was a thing that worked. Everyone wanted to go and see the see the blockbusters, and um, so that's what I've I've based the sporting events that I've I've been involved in is is building it into a, a blockbuster event. And um, you've got to find out we had we had limited resources. You've got to find out how you can use those resources or how you can tap into other people's resources to to build a blockbuster event. Yep. I mean, it is, yeah, very, yeah, very much so. You've got to, these are all the things you can do. Mm. You've just got to be able to allocate your resources appropriately. Exactly. I'm going to find out. I'm sure that's probably available on Amazon or something along the lines. I'd say it would be, yeah, definitely. And uh, I'll put a link in that. But Blockbusters is the, is the title. I'm going to, I'm going to look it up because I'm always interested. Because again, it's not, it's not just, hey, here's sport, yeah. but it's like, here's how the music industry does it, here's yeah. how the movie yeah, industry it, does it. exactly. Because yeah. you've got to, you know, take the best out of that and yeah. go, well, how do you go about building Yeah, exa- exactly. So it, uh, it talks about from uh, Real Madrid to, um, you know, movie studios to, studios to to Netflix. And I actually did the interesting um, fact is I actually did the course with Dwayne Wade, uh, Miami Heat uh, player and now Chicago Bulls uh, player. So, oh, okay. Yeah, we're yeah. just uh, dropping big names Yeah, now. exactly. I'll pick those names off before then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So... Uh, I'll finish with the finish with the the closing five. Do you remember the first sports event you ever attended? Yeah, so I, I grew up next to my um, Sandful South Australian National Football League uh, um, club, and so that would have been the first sports event. But I uh, remember my first MCG event, which is a one day match Australia versus West Indies, where we we got up by one run. That was the probably one of my best childhood memories. Oh, terrific. Do you have a uh, favourite uh, food memory at a sports event or a go-to food? Yeah, my, my go-to is pretty basic. It's uh, just the meat pie with, yep. a, with, a, with a lot of sauce. I, I will not go to the footy nowadays without having a meat pie with sauce. Yep. No, I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same. What's the, what's the first app you open in the morning? So I, I usually go to check Twitter just to see the news feed. I find that's the, the best news source. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's the first app. And if there's a, is there someone that the Sports Geek podcast listeners should follow and why? Yeah, I think um, a local guy, Liam Lenton, who's a professor at RMIT, and he okay. talks about the uh, economics of sport. Really, really interesting, and he uh, knows his stuff. And where where do you follow him? Is he on is he on the Twitter? Is he- he, he's on on Twitter mainly. Yeah, um, but he's also got uh, publications um, which are, are sold out at the moment. I looked uh, up the other day, and so um, well, that's that's always a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> that's always a good sign. Um, and uh, what social media platform is uh, is your MVP? Yeah, well, well personally, I, I love uh, um, picture tells a thousand words, so I lo- love looking at Instagram to keep in touch socially with with people, but. 
after this event, I've got to say Facebook is the is the best platform to use because of the the analytics, the reach, and part of the course that I did. Uh, although it's a very low click through rate, it's yeah. got the best click through rate from people sort of seeing what you're doing to actually clicking through and buying your ticket or product yeah. or whatever it is. Yep. Terrific. Where can uh, where can people connect with you on the internet? Uh, so I'm. I'm across all the platforms uh, and now sort of with EJ Witten and uh, Legends Game, we're, we're sort of across social media and on those platforms as well. And yeah, get, get on board because uh, we've, we've only just started in the last six weeks building that up. Um, and when I got there, I looked at our last, uh, I think uh, must, must have been Instagram posts and it was 2014. So yeah. we've uh, suddenly gone from, you know, Two posts, uh, two hundred posts in the last six weeks. Yep, um, and that's the thing. And now it's now it's just a matter of keeping that content ticking over and seeing how you can extend the message both of the Legends game, uh, the golf stuff, uh, you know, your golf days and those kind of things, and also the message. Yeah, yeah, like, and that's the thing. There's so much, you know. I when I walk through offices, whether it be at a footy club or or you know, in an office, and I walk into your office, there is so much content. Like just walking through your office, there's, you know, big long hall and there's pictures of Ted everywhere, big, you know, and so it's just a matter of capturing and documenting a bit of that to go, well, there's a lot of people that still have a lot of feelings for all of those memories and also everything going forward. How do we package that up and repurpose it on all these platforms? You know, so you don't lack for content, you just lack for the you know, getting the resource around it, but that's the that's a, that's the next stage of what we want to do. Yeah, it's interesting. The the, the hallway is almost like a, a player's race of, of photos either side of Ted Witten doing various things, and you look at each photo, and it's almost everything that Ted Witten Senior did was an Instagram social media event yeah. because ten thousand people turned up to see Lou Richards cut Ted Witten's lawn after losing a bet because. Um, Footscray beat Collingwood. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so Ted was a larger life figure both in the football world and then in the media world and in state uh, state football. So, um, and, yeah, had a, had a blast at the uh, at the Legends game and, you know, it wasn't manufactured. Uh, jo- you know, we nothing was uh, – John O'Brien yeah, had yeah, to get yeah. – still had to kick that goal for the win yeah. and, everyone had, and everyone, had a, everyone had a ball. Yeah, it was and what a, a fantastic finish and um, – Still gets uh, still getting coverage now. Uh, so I mean that that's the power of social media. It gets shared, and um, we just want it to uh, go viral and uh, make it to the to the states. Then it'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast, Nick, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Nick Holland, also known as at Nick Holland 2 on Twitter, 2 being his football number. And don't forget, if you want to check out what they're doing at the EJ Witten Foundation, you can go to ejwittenfoundation.com.au slash donate if you would like to leave uh, a donation. And if you want, you can dial it down to $5, but you could leave the default $20 to help me further bolster this case that I've been using. It's been a really busy day. Uh, the, the voice is getting a little bit uh, a little bit tired at the end of the day because on top of actually doing this intro and outro at the end of the day, we launched uh, Crowbot. Uh, Crowbot is the Adelaide Crows Football Club messenger bot uh, that we launched uh, as I record this three hours ago um, uh, so the initial returns are coming in uh, the crowbot's been built on the tradable bits platform so it's part of the partnership and did a bit of work on it when I was in Vancouver catching up with uh, Lenny and Darshan and uh, Anderson who put in a uh, put in a stack of work uh, into into the bot um, the reason we went with Tradable over a couple of other platforms is it hooks in really well with the, the data capture and the CRM profiling that, uh, that Tradable does with their tool. So everybody jumps in the bot. Uh, we capture their details from an email and a Facebook uh, uh, profile ID. Um, but then what we can do is further profile them based on some of the things that we're asking them. So uh, for the Crowbot, and uh, please go check it out. Um, just look up Adelaide Football Club in your messenger to see what it's doing. It has full player profiles, uh, highlight videos from all the players, some fun facts, uh, some gifts, and a little bit of fun in there. Um, so we're expecting the fans to sort of get lost in those player highlights. Uh, there's 45 people on the roster, so there's a lot to, to do. Um, and um, 
and you know Kieran Turner, who's head of digital there at uh, Adelaide Crows, um, he brought the 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 idea of this mini game, this Crows Your Own Adventure. If you've ever done those Choose Your Own Adventure novels as a as a young as a young fella or a young person, um, we built one of those in the game. So it, it sort of steps you through a scenario, and you as the fan have to have to make the decisions. Uh, so yeah, really fun uh, to build. Uh, there's uh, there's more in the design than there is in the in the app, I think, uh, and getting all that to work, uh, getting all the pieces to work. Um, so please, if you want to, uh, if you want to, if you're interested in one building a bot, wanting the understanding of it, um, how we went about uh, designing it. Uh, those kind of things. Please get in touch. Happy to have a chat about it. It will most likely share it into the Sports Biz Slack digital community or digital channel in the next uh, day or two and get everyone's feedback. Um, and the fact that it is works uh, is partnered uh, with Trader Wits. It does work well with our Sports Geek campaigns partnership um, because pretty much we now have a uh, an asset that we can both sell and have a have a partner involved. Uh, with the with the uh, with the bot and also integrate some sponsor messaging in the bot if we so if you wish to so um, that's sort of part of the um, uh, part of the whole part of the whole campaign it, primarily it's to to engage the fans around the finals uh, period um, but what we'll be looking to do is see how it evolves see how the fans start using it and what I do like um, about the the bot components that the tradable bits guys have built out is is it's sort of Semi AI, uh, where it starts uh, it starts seeing what people are typing and start f- pushing those people to specific and making effectively some guesses, and that's where the AI kicks in on uh, what cards should be shown on depending on the words. So we put in things like nicknames and variations of nicknames, and it starts getting all of those uh, all of those correct. So thank you very much to the uh, the Tradable Bits team in in helping us pull it together. Um, also thank you to Kieran for all his work in. Uh, getting us all the all the graphics and everything that we uh, that we needed, and also thank you to to, to my team in in Jolly and Meg to uh, do all the all the all the testing. But uh, yeah, shout out to Anderson who did a lot of the uh, did a lot of the dev work on on the Crowbot. So um, I'll have more information and more stats to share uh, in a future podcast. Um, but yeah, if you're very if you're interested, um, either give me a, a send me a email uh sean at sportsgeekhq.com or uh or hit me up via the sports biz slack to to know more and you know ask kieran of his experiences in the in the in the sports biz slack so really looking forward to seeing the opportunity and i think yeah it is a really good uh data capture tool so if you're looking to to get some of that data out of your uh, facebook fan base uh, i think the messenger bot well scoped uh, again you can't try to do everything um, can can do that. Uh, before I wrap up this episode, one last shout out. Uh, this episode's going to air and Sports Business Week will have started uh, around the world. Uh, SB Week 17 is the hashtag. Uh, please go check out sportsbusinessweek.com um, to find out if there is a an event in your city this week um, or, if, or if someone you know is running one. Um, all the money from the ticketing goes to support the V Foundation and to uh, support cancer research. It does feel like this has been a cancer research uh, uh, episode, but I do believe uh, both of these are uh, terrific causes. Um, and so please, uh, yeah, come go along to SB Week, uh, meet with your fellow colleagues. Um, shout out to uh, former guest uh, Russell Scabetti from Core for pulling this uh, together and getting it working, you know, all around the world. So uh, kudos to him. Uh, and that's it uh, for this episode. Stay tuned for the end. Um, there's the there's the legends, the finish of the legends game that Nick and I. Uh, spoke about with Jonathan Brown lining up for goal to win the match. Uh, that's what will be the sounds of the game after the credits. But until next episode, my name is Sean Callanan and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Join over 1,000 sports business executives in Sports Biz Slack. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash slack. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find out how to drive between eight and 30000 in profit for each digital campaign you sell sponsors. Check out sportsgeekcampaigns.com.
Just like Jimmy Butler, you can call Sean anytime at 61-407-0407-200.